So good morning. Apologies for my voice. The uh, I know many of you have family uh, and friends on the Texas coast in Houston. I'd ask you to keep them in your thoughts and in your prayers. Uh, uh, San Antonio is responding, I think, well to that assistance effort. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, a mentor and friend, Dr. Fred Corley. Uh, Dr. Corley. Dr. Corley is a real character, for those of you who know him. Uh, I've known him since I was an intern. Uh, and uh, He's one of the best, uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon, he's one of the best uh, clinical surgeons I know. Uh, he grew up in Yazoo City, uh, Mississippi. Uh, he was a very good student there, and a student athlete. He played uh, football and was recruited to Mississippi State, uh, where he, where he uh, was an uh, academic all-SEC uh, football player. Uh, he was, uh, he's a little bit like the medical version of Forrest Gump in that he was, uh, he's, he's been in most, uh, places, uh, at the time. He, he was in, in, uh, uh, at, uh, Mississippi State, uh, during the long, hot summer of 1964 when, with the, uh, forced integration of, uh, Ole Miss, and at the request of the Dean of Students, Dr. Corley was requested to, uh, to, to stay at Mississippi State all summer the next year to, uh, to work to eliminate any resistance to integrate the, the uh, school. Uh, and Richard Holmes was the first uh, African-American admitted to Mississippi State. And... Uh, in his own, in in Mr. Holmes, Dr. Holmes' own words, there were no cat calls, no racial slurs. It was quiet and serene, and nothing happened. There was just curiosity and disbelief. Uh, in many ways, it was serene uh, because uh, Dr. Corley, who was on the student body government government and a leader of their football team, was there to make certain that didn't happen. Uh, he uh, went to the University of Mississippi uh, Medical School uh, and then served two years in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Air Force where he was deployed with the U.S. Army in Da Nang, uh, Vietnam. He was nominated for the Air Force Cross for a service under fire in Vietnam uh, where he, where he uh, heroically resuscitated a severely injured sol soldier under austere circumstances in the middle of a firefight. Uh, he joined the, the Health Science Center uh, uh, with uh, Charlie Rockwood as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, did a brief stint at, uh, uh, in private practice, but uh, has been on the faculty for, uh, I guess, the past uh, 40 years. Uh, and uh, he's a, uh, a great person. He's a sincere, compassionate uh, and this last story, I think, sums up uh, Dr. Corley. Uh, the, uh, he was taking care of a patient who was, uh, who was uh, the caretaker for her ill mother. And uh, uh, she was having some difficulty caring for her mom. And uh, she called Dr. Corley and asked what to do. And... Uh, I would have probably told him they need to come to the hospital, something like that. But uh, uh, he recruited the help of a young orthopedic surgeon, which is always good for lifting help. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, and uh, they went and got the patient's mom. They picked her up. They took her to the hospital themselves uh, to get her care. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fred Corley. Thank you. I didn't write that introduction. Uh, <laughs> I've added a lot more. Um, I uh, and I appreciate y'all asking me to uh, to give this uh, talk. They uh, 
<clears throat> when Dr. Rockwood asked me to come back, he said, uh, well, what you have to do, Fred, you have to come out here and work, work real hard for 10 years, and then you can uh, <clears throat> just travel around and give talks. <laughs> and introduce people. Uh, well, I've worked hard for 40 years, and I'm not traveling around giving talks. <clears throat> and maybe you'll understand why after this talk. But uh, <clears throat> the obligatory joke about the orthopedic surgeon is the, <clears throat> the difference between a rhinoceros and an orthopedic surgeon. <clears throat> One's a thick-skinned, <clears throat> dim-witted, brute who charges a lot for nothing, and the other is an orthopedist. The other is a, the other is a rhinoceros, I'm sure. So that's my joke. Uh, they, uh, but it's fun to be here, and this is a talk entitled uh, Things I Wish I Would Have Known When I Was an Intern. We'll start off with a case. <clears throat> This is about a friend of mine uh, told me about this, but it could have happened to any of us. 51-year-old surgeon lacerated his left ring finger while fishing in coastal waters. So what does a general surgeon do? He goes home, he washes it out real well, puts bassy tracing on it. <clears throat> that night, he develops a lot of pain. He's in pretty good health, but he he's, uh, has psoriatic arthritis, and he takes one of those drugs about this long, and he can get an appointment with a rheumatologist. That night, the pain markedly increased. He goes to the hospital and sees his internist, who walks him over to the orthopedic hand surgeon next door, and this is what he had. And if you can see, his ring finger is... It's swollen, it's erythematous, it's <clears throat> painful, and it's got all of canaval signs for flexor tenosynovitis. He goes to the operating room, they do a, a flexor tenosynovectomy on him, <clears throat> opening up uh, uh, the flexor tendon sheath, and this is one of the, the grave infections in the hand. <clears throat> and as you can see from the anatomical drawing there, <clears throat> the sheath, uh, goes through the carpal canal up into the forearm. <clears throat> Most of us can count, and he's missing one finger uh, because this is his third operation, and he still uh, was dysvascular, so they did a ray resection on him, opened his forearm up. <clears throat> he continues to get sick. And he has some uh, lymphangitis up his form and eventually winds up with a below-the-elbow amputation. Fortunately, he's back at work. Uh, and uh, he's clinically uh, <coughs> sound and still alive, but all of this occurred from just a cut. So anybody that comes to see you is... Uh, <coughs> You're a patient, and they should be given your full attention. Now, could this have been uh, prevented? Probably not. It was one of those awful uh, marine bacteria, Vibrio vulnificus, and uh, <clears throat> just a bad problem in a guy that was immunosuppressed. Nothing of value has been received from regarding this presentation. I did expect to go to some big fancy place for supper last night. We were there. I was over at uh, we were there. Where were you? Subway, and uh, let me tell you, they just had two sugar cookies left when I, when I got there. Uh, and I do expect my picture to be up here on the wall. I've got a Kodak of me uh, that I will let you Xerox and put up over there. <clears throat> Every patient needs your full attention. Treat each patient as if they are the only one you are seeing that day. <clears throat> Hone your skills on a daily basis. <clears throat> now, those are things I didn't know early on in my career. But, uh, and a lot of my residents don't know early on in their career because they'll go down to clinic, they'll pick five charts up, and they'll say, cast, take stitches out. 
<coughs> and they get annoyed with me because I like to sit down and ask them, do they have any pets? <coughs> but, uh, and I can get through just as quickly as they can. <coughs> I wish I would have known when I was an intern that they were going to send me to Vietnam uh, and uh, I'm the guy in front. And if you think I know how to shoot that rifle, you are wrong. <laughs> they uh, they uh, issued me, I don't know whether any of you hunt, y'all are probably, but uh, a Model 1100 uh, Remington pump shotgun for my self-protection, and they gave me no shells. <laughs> they said, we'll give you something if they come through the wire. Well, fortunately, they didn't. But I would have studied a lot harder had I known that's what I was going to be doing the next year. <clears throat> I wouldn't have complained about clinic as much. This was my morning clinic in one of the villages around Da Nang. As you noticed, I was doing just about everything, uh, including some entertainment. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to be mentored by a lot of great people. And some of you may recognize Dr. Wilkins, Kay Wilkins down here with the trio. The guy next to him is Arthur Guyton, who was my physiology prof at Ole Miss, and uh, absolutely wonderful guy who you would never know he had polio, <clears throat> and he had to get around on Canadian crutches. He also had 11 children. It affects the anterior horn cell. It doesn't affect anything else. <laughs> he had 11 children, all of whom uh, are physicians. <clears throat> These are my mentors here at the uh, <clears throat> Department of Orthopedics, Drs. Hinchy, Heckman, Dr. Rockwood, Jerry Williams, one of our residents, Bernie Mari, Mike Worth, Jesse DeLee, Frank Netter. Frank Netter came here and spent a couple of years doing his last two books on the musculoskeletal system. He was an absolutely delightful guy, and uh, <clears throat> I took him to La Fagata. And uh, for lunch one day, Dr. Rockwood said, well, goddamn, take him down there. He doesn't, he doesn't know anything about Mexican food. So I took him down there. and. As I was coming out of the washroom, I saw him get a big spoonful of what he thought was soup. Well, it was a hot sauce. And he just started sweating, and he just sweated through, two shirt, uh, through his T-shirt and his outer shirt, and I resuscitated him, and uh, he finished his two books with us. Dave Green, my, my compadre in hand surgery here, Ron Williams, one of my chairmen, Bob Quinn, our current chairman. And there's some books that we published here, <clears throat> but the one that, <clears throat> that I think Dr. Rockwood is most uh, uh, proud is, uh, you need to get a watch. <laughs> you know this as a distinguished speaker here today. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> that the one that he's most proud of is the transportation of the sick and injured. <clears throat> and I was a resident here, and he came with this great big box of uh, cardboard box, and I could hear stuff rattling around in it, and he gave it to me, and he said, uh, you need to organize these slides, we're going to write a book. <laughs> there was no organization whatsoever, <clears throat> no numbers, no nothing. <clears throat> and so Dr. Rockwood, Dr. McPhee, Dr. Pistana, Dr. Oust <clears throat> uh, published the first emergency transportation of the sick and injured. And that has gone into <coughs> untold editions. We had the book on fractures, hand surgery, shoulder, sports medicine, elbow, and then lots of good friends that you make as residents. Uh, and you think those ducks were <coughs> a result of my uh, aim, they were not. And a lot of good residents that we've had here. The mind is like a cask into which many things are poured. If they are interesting and the cask is good, they will improve with time. 
If they are dull or the barrel is ordinary, no amount of aging will help. So when my residents leave here and they said, well, I didn't learn how to do hip replacements like they do at the Mayo Clinic. Well, you had an opportunity to, son. <coughs> I used to feel bad about it. I don't anymore. Uh, they're constants in life, gravity. <coughs> this, uh, this guy is a fellow named Eunice who was uh, at the Ringling Brothers Circus. My dad took us to the Ringling Brothers Circus. <coughs> I actually called his wife and have, a, have an x-ray of his finger. <clears throat> uh, the hand is durable. Gravity is the constant. Newton's second law of thermodynamics. What is that? <clears throat> entropy, entropy, entropy. So. Uh, <clears throat> Hurricane Harvey is not going to blow shingles back on my house. <coughs> it's going to destroy them either further. So, and my tennis shoe there, as long as I play, is not going to retie itself. So nature is prone to <coughs> entropy. And anatomy. Anatomy is the constant. So you've got gravity, you've got Newton's second law, you've got anatomy, and this is a constant. <coughs> the dumbass. And... <laughs> These are three of my residents who put that on my computer early on in my computer career, and I could never get it off. It was my, it was, it was my screensaver. Screensaver. So gravity, <clears throat> Newton's second law, <clears throat> the dumbass, those are things that keep orthopedists in practice. <laughs> uh, and this is what helps us, anatomy. You know, anatomy is the basis of all medicine, and we all need to know it. I'm going to have some vignettes. A 35-year-old shows up in the ER three weeks post-surgery from a wrist fracture, having taken his wet cast off and gone swimming. Now, this is the third in that category. This is a dumbass. And so he comes in, ranting and raving because his hand looks like this. <coughs> Actually, that's not a bad problem. All you've got to do is take them to the operating room, clean it up, and elevate it. <coughs> and that's just uh, gravity. If you hold your arm down, it's going to swell. If you hold it down a lot, it's going to swell and blister. So we kept him in the hospital a day or two and then sent him on his way, and he has done very well since then. Each patient deserves a complete history and physical exam. Now, I know that's upsetting. <coughs> But, but it is something. I have a stethoscope. You do? It was given me, and, uh, <laughs> and deserve a complete history and physical exam. A 19-year-old college pitcher is sent to me by the ER doc with a painful shoulder, so I examine him. He, he doesn't look really well. <laughs> He's pale. <laughs> He's got a fever. We used to have things called charts, and <clears throat> they would send them to you, and there would be their fever and their... Remember that, Dr.? Trashing and they had pulse rates and stuff like that, yeah. And uh, he, had, he was febrile, and uh, I looked him over, and he had some nodes in his neck. And, and he had a painful abdomen right here. So uh, we scanned him, and he had the mono. He had mononucleosis. He had a spleen. He had a bleed. It wasn't a bad bleed. And so I was patting myself on the back and uh, called his mother and said, uh, this kid's got mononucleosis. We're going to put him in the hospital for a couple of days. We don't want to send him back to his dorm room, and he should do fine. So I admitted him to the hospital, and they called me that night. <clears throat> he had started seizing. And so he continued to seize, and we tapped him. He had a encephalitis associated with it. He had to be intubated. And so uh, whenever I think of anybody with mononucleosis now, I think of encephalitis right after it. If a patient continues to complain, there's usually something wrong. 
56-year-old school teacher is seen in the ER on four successive nights with burning pain in her hand. So she sees our residents, sees the ER doc one night, and then sees our residents two nights in a row. Burning, terrible pain in her hand. They get all this work up on her x-rays, <clears throat> even ordered an MRI scan, and uh, finally she comes to see me. <clears throat> just in time for me to make the diagnosis. So she has herpes zoster. She has shingles. And often the pain precedes the, uh, uh, <coughs> the breakout, the skin problems associated with it. But if they come back and they come back, there's something wrong with them and they deserve to be really <coughs> looked at. If the patient calls you past midnight, you need to see him. In the old days, I used to give everybody my home phone number. <clears throat> I still do it now, I just don't answer it. I have a cell phone, but, <laughs> but, 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 but I give them my cell phone number now. And it's, it's, it's really surprising how few people call you. You know, they'll call you about something. Uh, usually the, this weekend I had a call from a guy who I'd given Vicodan to on Wednesday and somebody had broken into his car and stolen everything. So he wanted me to call in something. <laughs> I told him I wasn't gonna do it. Uh, he could come by the house. Uh, but uh, if the patient calls you past midnight, you need to see him. <clears throat> this is a 19 year old kid, called me complaining of pain in his chest. Pain in his chest, we had rotted a tibia on him about six or eight months earlier. And you say, well, what is the worst thing? He's probably just anxious. Uh, but I said, go to the emergency room, and I called the resident that was on call, and he was upset. He probably was nothing wrong with him. I said, well, see him. We got a chest X-ray, and you can see a wide mediastinum, and this kid had a <clears throat> dissecting thoracic aneurysm. Uh, that had occurred, the initial injury probably had occurred the night of his Rick, he had a chest contusion, and if you look back at the x-ray and the CT scan, then you may have been able to detect a little fluid, <clears throat> something that would have uh, aroused your suspicion. Well, anyway, he came back and uh, had to have surgery for that, and still a good uh, uh, patient that I see <clears throat> at least once a year. Workers' comp injuries should make one wary. Y'all ever seen any workers' comp? They're, they're interesting. A 24-year-old roofer with a nail gun continues to ask for narcotics. Now, how do I tell who are the residents here? Are they the small? Oh, they're the ones with the with the laptops open. Correct. Okay. <laughs> See, would one of you guys raise your hand if you're a resident? Hey, son. What's your name? Juan. What's your first name? Juan. Juan. Here. You see that X-ray? Don't come! Oh, don't come down! Don't come down. <laughs> I got a lot. I got a lot. I got to get out pretty quick, son. Uh, what do you see over there? A nail. Nail gun injury. <clears throat> That's a nail gun injury. What would you do with that? Take it out. Probably take it out in the OR or bedside and wash it up. Okay, take it out. Now that, that's the usual course. You know, somebody takes it out, washes it up, tells him to come back if he's got any problems. Well, this guy kept coming back, kept coming back. My residents <coughs> uh, <coughs> didn't examine him. You know, if he comes back, oh, he's, too, he's got good pulses, he can move his, but um, they, <coughs> they didn't palpate. And if you put your hand on his anterior compartment, it felt like a <coughs> line purring. <coughs> so... He developed an AV fistula. <clears throat> so if he comes back, now what is an AV fistula? Do you know what that is? Communication with your doctor. What, what are the physical signs of it? Uh, a thrill. A thrill. Yeah. Uh, a thrill in a brewery, and that's what they should have looked for. Well, he had an AV fistula and had a reason. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> they sometimes will borrow mine. <laughs> sometimes will borrow my stethoscope. <laughs> Stuart was down there one day. I, I, you know, you can. 
he was fertile ground for knowledge and still may be. But uh, I was a, a guy had come in with uh, trauma. We, could, we didn't know we couldn't. That, those were the days when we couldn't get an X-ray right away. So I was tapping his his uh, patella and listening to his symphysis pubis. And Stuart said, "Do you hear any heart sounds down there?" I said, "No, no, no, no." no. That's the way you. <laughs> that, that's that's the way you test for, to see if there's a uh, fracture, the sound conduction. That's a good trick. Yeah, it is a good trick, huh? Tell what, 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 what you listen. Well, if you put put your stethoscope on his symphysis pubis and hit his patella, you can <clears throat> hear the sound transmitted on either side. But if you have a femur fracture, if you have a femur fracture, it doesn't transmit. I learned that in the Army. If you called in a medevac and there was no fracture <clears throat> and these guys were shot at, they would really hammer you uh, when you got home. Uh, <clears throat> so you had to make sure you had a fractured femur. If it doesn't look right, it usually isn't. I want to tell you a story on me. Just This is the only story I'm going to tell on me, and, I, and everything that Stuart said about me was true. <coughs> they... Uh, about six months ago, Saturdays are great days for me because I can come to work about five in the morning and nobody bothers you. You can sit there in your office, you can, you can read, you can prop your feet up. Uh, and I've got a buddy that I ate breakfast with, is actually was in, was in Vietnam with me, and so I was going to meet him at 8.30 at Jim's, and I was driving back just north of uh, the golf course in Almost Park. And there was a, a, an attractive student over there pushing her car. She was like this, pushing, trying to push her car. And so I felt benevolent. So I got out and I, I said, <laughs> I figured she was from Trinity and she'd run out of gas or something. So I got out and I and I and I started pushing with her and I said, I said we aren't going anywhere. Let me give you a hand. We aren't going to go anywhere. I said, uh, why don't you get in your car and make sure that it's a, it's a neutral? And she looked at me like I was an idiot. And she said, this isn't my car. And I said, well. Why are you pushing it? She said, I'm not pushing it. I'm just stretching. I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to go. Go run. So I left quickly and didn't give her my name. So it looked right. <laughs> but if it doesn't look right, it usually isn't. This is a 45-year-old drunk on a motorcycle. Comes to the emergency room with this, this injury, and Betty Zaley, who was, who was a great resident and a faculty member here, uh, called me and she said, Dr. Corley, this guy's got some fractures of his thumb and index <coughs> metacarpal. She said, but something just doesn't look right. So we got here and we investigated him a little further and we found out that the <coughs> scaphoid, which is here, <coughs> needs to be there. And uh, I didn't know whether to try to milk it down or to, <laughs> to open it up there and put it down. Anyway, anyway we, we fixed him, and it's amazing how some people do. And this has been... 25 years, and he still comes to see me once a year complaining of no pain. <laughs> so if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. Make your own diagnosis. <clears throat> so if some PG six weeks calls me and said, <clears throat> Dr. Corley, we got a guy, cyclist, two days post IM rod, <clears throat> For a left femur fracture, he's going into the DTs. I said, well, how can you tell? Well, he's shaking and he's got fever and <clears throat> he's just not himself. He's, he's out of his gourd. He's going into the DTs. Well, did he drink before he came in? Well, he said, I don't know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you've got to make sure that they are going into the DTs because there's something else that can kill you. 
and that's called a fatty emboli syndrome. And we occasionally will see that here. It's not as common as it used to be because we're getting people up, up uh, sooner. Any of you guys ever read this book? Did you go to Ole Miss? No. Oh. <laughs> What's it about? That's right, and he dies of a pulmonary embolus, I mean of a fatty emboli. <clears throat> the protagonist in there is a guy named Phineas, but it's a great book, and it was required reading at Yazoo City High School. Uh, <clears throat> doctors get sick. <laughs> I mean real sick. Uh, Dr. Stewart called me one day and he said, he couldn't get anybody else to answer the phone. He said, have you ever seen bilateral Bell's palsy? I said, are you kidding? I said, we could write that up. No, one of my interns, our residents, has been admitted with bilateral Bell's palsy. We got her out of this hospital pretty quick. <laughs> and, they, and they treated her for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, so doctors do get sick and they need to be taken care of. 60-year-old MD, now three weeks post-MVA. <coughs> Not a bad accident, but he was admitted over here and just overnight. And uh, <coughs> examined uh, not, not as well as he should have been. Uh, but he calls me and says his shoulder hurts. So he comes to the clinic over there and we x-ray his shoulder and it looks all right. And uh, <clears throat> get him to make a, uh, <clears throat> do, a, do a pretty good history and physical on him. And he's got problems with his neck. So I said, well, we need to get an x-ray of your neck. No, 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 there's nothing wrong with the neck. Well, we, <laughs> we, we, we got an x-ray of his he neck. Wasn't seen here. Huh? <laughs> Where was he seen? He wasn't seen here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he had a uh, fracture subluxation and some compromise to the cord. And uh, we had to get him decompressed. So you need to examine your patients. <laughs> if, if somebody comes in. <laughs> You need to examine them every day, a trauma patient, and feel each bone or joint. And if they are tender, then you need to uh, investigate it. 35-year-old <clears throat> alcoholic, and this is one of uh, Ronnie's and my patients. Two days post-op, I am Rod, left femur, has trouble moving his left arm and leg. Two weeks, two days post-injury. He wore a seatbelt and a shoulder harness, and he had a lot of ecchymosis here and so we worked him up and he had a dissecting uh, <coughs> uh, internal carotid artery uh, aneurysm that caused the, the uh, hemiparesis. So you need to make <coughs> making rounds is not nine people going into the room and talking to him it's looking at the patient. 35-year-old alcoholic, three years post ORI, three days post ORI of his acetabulin, continues to drop his hematocrit after six units of blood. He's probably bleeding. In the old days, that would mean we would have to open him up and find the superior gluteal artery. Uh, now, fortunately, the uh, the uh, radiologist can help us, and they can clot it off. So they need to be taken care of and followed uh, by the same doctor that did the surgery. 35-year-old <clears throat> alcoholic is six hours post-op ORI distal radius and is having considerable pain. What do you do? Juan, what would you do if you were on orthopedics? Would you call me? <laughs> so if somebody, so what, what's the worst thing that can happen to a guy post-op from, from a, <clears throat> an orthopedic fracture? <laughs> Uh, compartment, syndrome. compartment syndrome. So if they've got a lot of pain, then you, you have to go up there and can, uh, investigate it. Don't just order, don't just order uh, uh, some more pain meds. You have to go up and, and investigate it, particularly if you don't know much about the patient. And uh, uh, 
Compartment syndromes are not common, but they're devastating if they're not recognized. And if the nurse asks you to come up and do it, I see her, uh, please, please do it. We have, a, we have some, uh, I heard one of my residents saying, asking the nurse, are, are you raising your voice at me? Well, if the nurse raises your, her voice at you, you're probably the guy in the wrong. So you need to get up there and <coughs> see the patient. It's a lot easier to get a resident than it is to get a new nurse. <coughs> If it looks bad, it usually is. This is an 18-year-old high school football player with a two-day history of pain in the arm. And you can see that he's got, he's got induration and pitting edema on his chest. He's got an erythematous uh, <clears throat> upper arm and forearm, and he has necrotizing fasciitis and actually survived and played football. So if it looks bad, it usually is. Do it when it needs to be done. I worked for my granddaddy, he had a hardware store when I was, would go over there in the summers, <laughs> and he would always tell me, do it and do it now. He always said that you can't make a living from an empty wagon, you had to have something in it. So. <laughs> He also said that about some people's intelligence, uh, <laughs> that an empty wagon made more, more, more noise. <laughs> Do it when it needs to be done. Do you wait until the next morning to operate on this? <laughs> this is not cellulitis, and it's not something you can elevate, put on antibiotics, and hopefully get better. So that needs to be operated on that night. Sometimes you will make a mistake. A type 1 diabetic with a painful swollen foot. Juan, do you have a friend? Not many. <laughs> Ask one of your friends what do they see right here. So they, they should have, uh, this, is, this is a little fellow that went to, a little piggy that went to market here. He's gone. <laughs> He's gone. You would anticipate that they may have had some surgery on that foot, but they hadn't. So this looks like a bad osteomyelitis. So we take it to the operating room, there was no pus. So you take a biopsy and send it to the, uh, to the uh, pathologist, and it's a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. So we didn't consider that in our differential. And it didn't hurt the patient, but it was something that we should have considered. This is a 45-year-old alcoholic with a painful swollen elbow. What does that look like? Huh? What? Septic electronic uh, I thought. So we open that up and <clears throat> no pus. I mean, but it bled. Jesus, did it bleed? And uh, we took a biopsy of the tissue, and that was another malignant fibrous histiocytoma uh, <clears throat> that the guy had had for about six or eight months, but we had assumed that it was just something recent. And uh, fortunately, with a right resection, he, he survived. 45-year-old diabetic with a painful swollen thigh. <clears throat> of course, by the time we see him, they've gotten MRI scans, and the patient uh, looks sick. Her, her uh, white blood count was about 15,000. She was uh, uh, temp 100.3. Uh, she had a lot of pain just on the left uh, adductor compartment in her leg. And you can see some changes there on the, on the MRI scan. <clears throat> and this is something that you can often mistake for a uh, pyogenic process, but this is diabetic myonecrosis. 
And the problem with operating on it, if you operate on it, there's a <coughs> tendency for this dead muscle to get infected. It's usually, usually in the compartment, it's usually in the thigh, it's usually in the adductor compartment. They aren't as sick as you would see in somebody with a septic uh, uh, process. 35-year-old motorcyclist struck by a motor, motorist and thrown into a water-filled ditch. So <clears throat> you learn about water. And this guy had Aramonas hydrophilia and had a degloving injury to his leg, and he uh, <clears throat> came within an inch of dying because he wouldn't let us take his leg off. And fortunately, he uh, did and uh, survived today so that he's a has a prosthesis and can still golf. Uh, <clears throat> but water-filled, waterborne injuries are really, really, really bad problems. Always have them come back if they have any changes. So if you see somebody and you say, well, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> call me if there's any change or come back if it doesn't get better. Are you given an appointment? It's best to give them an appointment. This is a guy that came in with this uh, finding here, and that's a, uh, something that you see with a diabetes and ulnar nerve palsy. They have a claw hand. Uh, so we sent him to get some EMGs to see what we could do, and he did not get the EMGs, but he did come back a year and a half later, and I'm the only name he knew in that clinic. What do you think is going along there, Juan? I could make you a genius today if you answered some of these questions from Dr. Stewart. <laughs> That's leprosy. So they get a, uh, uh, and, and, and it's not, <coughs> leprosy is not commonly seen here, but it is endemic. And you often will see a neuropathic foot that you might attribute to diabetes that is actually um, secondary to leprosy. There was a the uh, the hospital for uh, the hospital for Hansen's disease uh, is in still in uh, Louisiana, I think. Uh, but we used to have to go there for an insensitive foot course, which was really. Dr. Paul Brand was a great uh, teacher. Now here are the things you need to, <clears throat> all of these little vignettes, I hope, uh, emphasize that you need to pay attention to certain patients. People that are unconscious, they can't answer you. People that are sedated or drunk. If you can't get a good exam on them, if you've got a bad radiograph, and if you don't know, so if your intern goes up there and he examines a patient, he's not as smart as you are, uh, <clears throat> He may not pick it up, but these are the, these are the patients that you need to pay uh, attention to. These are the things that, that we miss in, in uh, trauma. Scaphoid fractures, that little bone in the wrist, uh, often is fractured. Often early on, you won't get a, uh, an x-ray that'll prove it. Tendon injuries, if you don't examine uh, <coughs> lacerations to the hand, uh, specifically, you can miss tendon injuries. Elbow fractures, particularly radial head fractures. Femoral neck fractures associated with femur fractures are missed fairly often. And shoulder dislocations, posterior shoulder dislocations, which are uh, secondary often uh, to uh, seizures. And the AP looks like a normal AP. Why do people make mistakes? They're human. They don't know. They're arrogant, and this may be the reason that they make many mistakes. They don't take time or check the chart. They don't ask for help. They don't trust the patient or the nurse or their own skills. Transitions. So if you've got a patient that you're going to take care of the whole time they're in the hospital, it's easy for you to do it. But if, you ta if somebody else comes and takes over for you, you have to really make sure that you communicate the uh, findings. 
You need to prioritize your diagnoses, but always consider your feared diagnoses. So if somebody comes into me with a headache, I assume that they have a brain tumor and I try to rule that out. <laughs> That's right. 